are wrapping up a series today called My Mind on My Money and My Money on My Mind. We're talking about how do we get our minds off of our money. We opened this series with a study that shows that one of the top consuming thoughts on our mind is our money. How do I make more? Will it be around when I need it? Where in the world did it go? I thought I made enough and I got too much month at the end of the money. Who's been there? Yeah, okay, I see that hand. So what we're doing is we're talking three, princ three principles over the course of three weeks. I cannot recap one and two, so I'll just give you the quick bullets, and then we're going to dive into today. Principle number one, if we want to get our mind off our money and our money off our mind, we've got to understand that God is the owner. I am the what? Say it if you know it. Manager, yes. Until we understand this principle, nothing else makes sense. From a biblical perspective, we must understand God is the owner. I am the manager. Principle number two is a little planning goes a long way. A little planning goes a long way. And I also learned that um, if I want to receive tremendous feedback on a message, I just need my wife to join me on stage. You guys obviously love her more than me. I'm a little offended, but I get it. She's, she's you know, awesome, and that's why I married her. And so today, principle number three, if we want to... If we want to get our mind off of our money, we don't want it to consume us. We want to honor the Lord with it. Principle number three is this. Write it down. you got to put God in his place. Put God in his place. In order to get our mind off our money, we need to put God in his place. Now, normally putting someone in their place sounds like a bad thing, doesn't it? It's like, oh, man, you really put him in his place. That's not what I mean. My question to you is this. What place... Do you want God to be in your life? What place would you, would you prefer God to be? I mean, if you were to list all of your relationships, hobbies, jobs, where would you hope that God would fall on that list? Would he be near the top? Maybe somewhere in the middle? May, I mean, would he even be on the list? Maybe you've never even thought about, like, where, I don't know, where, where God's place would be or, or where it should be. Here's what I want you to know. This is something I've learned. You can put God where you want, but if you want to experience his blessing, only one place will do. There's only one place. Let me show you a few scriptures. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. I love that. God's like, put some respect on my name. There's none like me. I don't share my glory. I don't yield my glory. I am first. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. This is when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. Commandment number one says this. You shall have no other gods before me. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 through 18 says, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the what? Supremacy. I mean, it just says he's the owner, the author, the creator, the sustainer, the provider, the protector. He's the glue that holds it all together. And so there is one acceptable place for God. I want you to write this in your notes. God's place is first place. God's place is first place. And here's what you need to know. He won't settle for second place. He won't bless second place. He's not a second place God. Like, think about it like this. Um, God has no second place trophies. There are no runner-up trophies in God's trophy room, if he were to have one. He doesn't take second place. He's either Lord of all, or he's not Lord at all. And so we put him first. God's place is first place. In the morning, you put God first. In your relationships, put God first. If you own a business, put God first. In your home, put God first. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus goes through a list of things that, that people tend to worry about. He, he goes on about, why do you, you know, worry so much? Why do you worry? And I, I just will direct this to you. What, what are you worried about? What, why do you worry so much? Why, why do you worry about what to eat? 
or what to wear or, or about your bodies or about your life. Jesus says, doesn't, you know, you, you matter more to God than, than even the, the sparrows, the birds of the air, the flowers of the fields. And then Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus says this. He says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and watch all these things will be given to you as well. What things? All these things that you were worrying about. Seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. Verse 34, therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I mean, how often do we get caught up worrying about things that are just so far down the road? We can't do anything about it anyway. There's another passage that says, who by worrying can add a moment, a minute to their life? None of us. Science has actually proven that worry takes away years off of our life. So Jesus says, seek him first and he'll take care of everything else. He'll bless the rest. Would you write this down? Put God first and he will bless the rest. Put God first and he will bless the rest because God's place is is first place, and if we want to win in the area of finances and experience God's best, we must put God in his place because his place is first place. So today, I wanna teach a principle that's changed my family and many, many others. I believe it's a biblical principle, but I also want you to know that it tends to be a controversial principle. Not all churches teach it. The stats would say that only about 20% of Christians practice it, but I truly believe this one principle will change your life, it will change your family, it will change your business, it will change your legacy, and I can say that with confidence because it's changed mine. And what I wanna teach about today is called the principle of the tithe. The tithe, T-I-T-H-E, the tithe. Now this is not a word that gets used often around just our world, we hear it in, in church, but. I need you to know it was never intended to be a, a churchy word. So let's talk about what is a tithe and tithing. What does it mean? Here's what I want you to know. Write this down. Tithing puts God first in your finances. So if God's place is first place, how do we do that? We do that through tithing, and tithing puts God first in your finances. So what is it, and why does it even matter? So we... Uh, we talk about the tithe in church, but oftentimes as churches, we fail to teach on the tithe. And one of the biggest reasons this topic doesn't get talked about is because there's an assumption that if the church talks about money, it must need money, and it wants money, and if it talks about money, the people are going to leave. But I need you to know that this church has never been healthier financially than it currently is. The reason that this matters so much to me is because someday I will stand before the Lord and give an account on how I taught his word. And I don't ever want to stand before the Lord and say, I refuse to teach this one principle because I was afraid that people might leave. What I know is there is a blessing on this principle. And so I think it would be poor leadership, poor stewardship to be called to preach the word but not talk about the principle of the tithe. So that's what I'm gonna do today. I got a lot of teaching. I'm gonna teach fast, so you gotta listen fast and take notes fast. So let me answer the question, what is the tithe? If you're taking notes, write this down. The word tithe simply means a tenth. One tenth. One tenth. Ten percent. That's all the word means. Now, we could use this in any other area of life, but we don't. Like, you could, if you have pizza later today and there's ten slices, you could say, could I get a tithe of that? And if you ask for a tithe of the pizza, how many slices are you asking for? One, okay, so there's 10 and you want one. Let's just say that you got an order of 30 chicken wings and you're like, can I get a tithe of those wings? You're asking for how many wings? Three, yes, let's say you open a box of peanut M&Ms, not the bag, because they, they've got like 12 of them in a bag, but you got the box, you open it, there's 40 of them, you're like, hey, could I get a tithe of those peanut M&Ms? You're asking for four, yeah, so it's just simple math, a tithe means a tenth, that is all that it means. However, when we see the tithe in scripture and when I teach on the tithe, I wanna give you a more thorough understanding and definition. And so here's, here's a definition for, for tithing, okay? This is kinda long, start writing. Tithing is returning the first 10% of your income to God through the local church. Now I'll say it again and then we'll break it down. So if you don't get it all at once, don't worry about it. Tithing is returning the first 10% of your income to God through the local church. 
We'll break this into three sections so that I can explain it. Number one is this, tithing is returning, returning. Leviticus chapter 27 verse 30 says, a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, it does what? Say the next word, it belongs, I want you to notice that it belongs to the Lord, it's holy to the Lord. Imagine if you are a farmer and you make your living through crops. God is saying that a tithe, 10% of your crops, whether grain from the soil, fruit from the trees, they be, it belongs to the Lord, it's holy to the Lord. So tithing, we say tithing is returning because the reason it is returning is because it doesn't belong to us. Notice that tithe doesn't belong to To the farmer, it belongs to the Lord. Keep in mind, God is the owner. We are the manager. So the first thing I want you to know about tithing is it's not giving. We're not giving the tithe. We're returning the tithe. We're returning to God what already belongs to him. Now let's go to number two. So so tithing is returning. Number two, the tithe is the first 10%. The tithe is the first 10%. If we go through scripture 16 different times, we see God saying, the first belongs to me. The first belongs to me. The first belongs to me. It'd probably take me three or four times here and that to go, I think the first belongs to God. 16 times, God says, the first belongs to me. And here's what happens. When you return the first, you are trusting God with the rest. Because it takes faith to give first. It takes faith to receive your pay, your income, and the very first thing you do is you set aside that tithe to return it to the Lord. It does not take any faith to, you know, go through your month and go through all of your expenses and then whatever's left, say, God, I'm going to give you a little bit of what's left. If God is going to be first in our life, he should be first in our finances. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10 says, honor the Lord with your wealth with the first fruits of your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing. Who here wants some, some big barns? Like I like big barns and I cannot lie. I want overflowing barns. I want so much crops in the barns. He says, if you will honor me with your first fruits and your wealth, then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Some of you are like, I want the wine. You can keep the barn. I hear you. But how often do we say, God, if you will overflow my barns and my vats, then, and God says, no, 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 you've got it backwards. Put me first. If you honor me, then I will bless you. I want you to notice the blessing follows the honoring. The blessing follows obedience. Because when we step out, God steps in. Here at LifePoint, we have a value of faith that says when we step out, God steps in. And I know this much, I know across our campuses, I know Carolina Beach, there's not a single person that wouldn't want their finances overflowing. However, the key to that is putting God first. When you put God first, he'll bless the rest. So the first belongs to God, tithing is returning. The tithe is the first 10%. And here's what I think is so incredible about God. Because so often we would look and go, well, I don't know if I, could, if I can do that. And what I think is amazing is that God sets a percentage that I believe anybody can accomplish. It doesn't matter, you know, if you are a middle schooler who cuts grass on the weekend, you can honor God with the tithe. If you are a multi-corporation owner, the percentage is the same. And so often we think, when I get to this place in life, then I will. And the reality is God goes, no, if you're not faithful with where you are, you won't be faithful when you get there. The standard is the same. And so practically speaking, how do we put this in play in our lives? How do we do this? Last week, my wife and I, we showed you our budget. That was a little bit embarrassing. It's kind of like, I don't know if I want everybody seeing this. But it was our budget. But if you remember, the very top of our budget was the tithe. The tithe was first, and then there were some generosity categories that matter to us. And so when we put together our budget, we put the tithe on there first. It, it matters. And so for Michelle and I, we, use, we actually use a feature. Here at LifePoint, um, we get paid once a month. I don't know how it works. At your, your job might be first and 15th. Maybe you're once a month. Maybe it's on a job-by-job basis. But what we do is we use a feature called recurring giving. 
If you've never been on our giving page, I would encourage you, you can go to lifepointnow.com slash info, and there's a button that says give. I, I've got a screenshot of it here just to kind of walk you through. This is how we do it. And so when you go to this page, you have the option of giving one time or setting up what's called recurring giving. And so for us, our pay is the same every single month. It doesn't fluctuate. And so we set up recurring giving, and you can choose an interval every week, two weeks, every month, on the 1st and 15th monthly. You can put when do you want this to get started. And so for us, since it's, you know, at the, uh, we get paid on the very last day of the month. So the first day of the month, we set up our giving. You can even choose uh, the campus that you attend so that it's designated that, to that campus. And for us, it's something that happens automatically it's such a priority that we don't want it to fall down the list of things I don't want to get paying my mortgage and paying my insurance and paying the groceries and and be like oh yeah whoops we forgot about the Lord for us we want it to be a priority now some would say but doesn't that take some of the like worship out of it I mean you don't even think about it it just happens like the bank just does it and I would say it depends on how you define worship If you define worship as a feeling, then I could see how it could make you feel that way. You could be like, man, I just, I don't know, it takes some of that that sense of I'm bringing my worship to the Lord. And I would say I define worship as a response to who God is and what he's done. And for me, part of worship in the Lord is just saying I want him to be first in my life and I want to be consistent in this. And so I don't worship based on my feelings. I don't tithe based on my feelings. I think that tithing, it's a privilege to return to the Lord. It's a joy to be able to return to the Lord, but it's also a discipline. And what I found is most areas of life that require discipline are not always enjoyable. You know what I'm talking about? Like going to the gym is not always a joy. Flossing, oh my word. I know some of you love it. I floss like the week before I go to the dentist, just so I don't have to lie, but they see right through it. They know. You wouldn't be bleeding like this. I'm like, well, you poking me with that thing. You know, I I don't always feel like working out, but I love the feeling of having worked out. Rarely in the moment does it does it feel good, but because it's a discipline, it's something that I, I try my best to automate what's important. I try my best to do this. For many years, for my wife and I, when our kids were younger, we knew. You know, consistent date night was critical. Consistent date night was critical. And so consistent became every Tuesday night was our date night. Our kids knew it. They're like, you guys going out tonight? And, and yes, we are going out. It's a, it's a big deal. Now that our kids are older, we can go out whenever we want. But we automate the important. I, I have a set gym time that I hit almost every day. I have a routine in the mornings that I hit practically every morning. It's it's automatic. It happens because it matters. Listen, if it's important, you'll find a way. If it's not, you'll find an excuse. We make time for what matters. To me, automating it takes the emotion out of it. I do it because it's the right thing to do. It's what I want to do. I predetermine I'm going to honor the Lord. And when you put God first, here's the thing. It causes you to reorient the rest of your spending around your priorities. And so tithing, it's returning. It's returning the first 10% of your income. Number three is this, tithing is through the local church. Through the local church. Now this is a longer passage. This is kind of the preeminent passage when you hear somebody teach on tithing. I want to go there and then I want to give a little bit of an explanation. In Malachi chapter three, verse six, here's what the Bible says. Starts with this phrase, says, I, the Lord, do not change. We know that, Hebrews 13, eight. He's the same yesterday, today, forever. He says, I, the Lord, do not change, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you've turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. So quick pause. God's people have been ignoring him, and he's calling them out on it. He's saying, you return to me. The only reason you're still here is because I am a promise-keeping, covenant-keeping God, because the way you've been acting... And I should have wiped you out a while ago. That's basically what God is saying. But he's like, I keep my word, but you need to return to me, and I'll return to you. And so they respond, how are we to return? Look at verse 8. Will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me? Listen, if God accuses you of robbing him, we, we should all be like, okay, how am I doing that? And that's what they ask. How are we robbing you? Listen, in tithes and offerings, You're under a curse, your whole nation, because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe 
into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Verse 11, I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit there, uh, before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Isn't that what we want? So overflowing with the blessings of God that every nation around us is like, man, I don't understand. Like, given this economy, how do you do so well? Given this economy, how are you, how do you have such a joy? How do you have such a peace? I took God at his word. And I put him first. And he said he would protect and he would provide. And that's what he's done over and over and over. So he tells him, he says, you need to bring the tithe into the storehouse. In the Old Testament, the storehouse was the temple. When we see the New Testament, we see people bringing their tithe, bringing their offerings to the local church. Now, I want you to know, it's okay to give offerings to other, you know, organizations. We, we partner with a lot of organizations. You can give offerings to missionaries, sponsor kids, people in need. That's great. I encourage that. But that's not what the Bible considers a tithe. That would be an offering. And we give towards special initiatives. When we do that, when we partner with Lifeline Pregnancy Center, that is a special offering that's above and beyond our tithe. The reason we say tithing is through the local church is because when you tithe to the church, that money is used to impact not only our own community, which is amazing seeing what God's doing in this region, but also through all the ministry partners that we, that we come alongside, we partner with. For instance, Amigos for Christ, when we send trips to Nicaragua and we put in water systems. When you tithe here at LifePoint, some of it goes to Amigos for Christ. Some of it goes to Association of Related Churches. They plant churches all over the world now. Convoy of Hope, man, those guys have been front lines of every disaster lately. And they're there because churches like you, churches like us, partner with them. Mercy Chefs. They were set up in our parking lot during Florence, and when they did that, we said, we will, we will support you guys. We love what you do. So when you tithe here at LifePoint, you're supporting Mercy Chefs, and there's local ministry partners. And I want you to know, you're not just giving to the church, you're giving through the church. And what tithing does is it positions us to bless others as well as receive blessings from God. God's literally saying, if you will do that, I will do this. What is the this that God promises? We saw it in verse 10. He says, test me in this. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. See if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I love the sound of that. I've never met anybody that didn't want that in their life, but I've got to tell you, it's your move. It's your move. Step out and see how God steps in. God is inviting you to test him. So what is tithing? Tithing is returning the first 10% of your income to God through your local church. Through your local church. Now I mentioned that there tends to be some controversy around the subject of tithing. Let me speak to that for just a moment. Usually when I talk about tithing, there's two questions that come up. And there's a lot more that I can't get to. There's actually a resource I've been telling you about called Managing God's Money by Randy Alcorn. There's a whole section where he goes way deeper than I ever could. I'd encourage you, pick that up if you haven't. Or you can go to uh, lifepointnow.com slash money. And there's some resources there where you'll find a link to be able to pick that up on Amazon if you'd like. But here's the two questions that come up. First is, isn't tithing Old Testament? Pastor, isn't that an Old Testament principle? And second, isn't tithing legalistic? Is it Old Testament? Is it legalistic? Let's start with a legalistic question. Anything can become legalistic if we let it. Am I right? Anything can. Church attendance can become legalistic. Reading your Bible can become legalistic. Prayer can become legalistic. Serving. So, so certainly tithing, giving can become legalistic. Whether or not something can be legalistic doesn't mean you shouldn't practice it. It comes down to your motive. Your motive determines, like, are you doing this so God's, like, I don't want the Lord to be angry with me, so I guess I'll just do this. I'm trying to do this so that I can earn favor with the Lord and be in, you know, you know right standing. I'm trying to earn, I'm trying to, to work for. We don't work for the approval and affection of God. We work from it. 
We have it. Because we have it, we want to honor him. We don't honor him so that he loves us. Does that make sense? So yes, can it become legalistic? Absolutely, but so can being, you know, right here today. So can getting up in the morning and be like, I've got to check off that box on my YouVersion Bible app. I mean, any, anybody here, like, if you got a checklist, you got to check all it off. And then if you do something that's not on the list, you write it on the list so you can check it off? Okay, it shouldn't be like that when it comes to our time with God, our tithes, our prayers. So, so can it be legalistic? Absolutely, certainly can. Certainly can, but it shouldn't be. Check your motive. Why, why do I do it? The Lord loves a cheerful giver. Am I doing this out of, you know, obligation? Fine, I'll put you first, God. Or is it like, no way. Look at how blessed I am. Why would I not want to honor you? There's a difference. Second question was, is, is tithing Old Testament, Old Covenant? What I mean by that is when we look at the Old Testament, there's, a, there's the law, there's the Old Covenant, and Jesus comes and he says there's a New Covenant. So the Old Covenant is law, New Covenant is grace. And so the question is, is tithing an Old Covenant thing? And that's a great question because we definitely see it when we look at the Old Testament. We see it, and we seem to see more of it when we look at the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, for the Jews, they didn't just give a 10% tithe. Did you know that? They had three tithes that they would give. And one of those was every three years. So they had two annual tithes, and then one tithe that happened every third year, which means that on average they gave 23%. They returned 23% of their income on a yearly basis. And so we see tithing throughout the Old Testament. So the question that should follow is how do we know that as New Testament believers, this is something we should still do, we should still practice? And I'll give you just a couple thoughts about that. If you want to jot these down, you can. They're not on the screen. I'll give them to you real quick. Number one is nowhere in the New Testament do we see that tithing has ceased. Nowhere in the New Testament do we see where tithing has ceased. The, the second thought that I'll give you, and this comes out of a quote from Pastor Randy Alcorn in Money, Possessions, Eternity, another book that he wrote. He, he says this, culturally, this is important to understand. Jesus was raised in a devout Jewish home, meaning that his parents tithed and instructed him to tithe. The Old Testament, the only Bible Jesus knew, also taught him to tithe. During his ministry, although Jesus was carefully scrutinized by his enemies and accused of every possible offense, including breaking the Sabbath, never once did they accuse him of violating the law of tithing. The Talmud, which is a rabbinical teaching, it forbade a strict keeper of the law from sitting down to dine with anyone who did not tithe. Yet on several occasions, the Pharisees ate at the same table with Jesus, obviously Christ tithe. Just interesting from a cultural perspective because it's so different. Here's another reason. In a heated argument that Jesus had with the Pharisees, he affirms tithing. In Matthew 23, verse 23 and verse 24, Jesus says to these Pharisees, he says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Those are fighting words right there. He says, you hypocrites, you give a tenth of your spices, your mint, your dill, your cumin. What's he mean? I mean, these are the tiniest little things. You make it a point that you're giving the 10% the of the smallest little things, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law. Justice, mercy, faithfulness. Here's where you need to pay attention. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. And then he says, you blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but you swallow a camel. What? Yeah, you're worried about the smallest little thing, and you should, but don't turn it into a legalistic obligation that gets you off the hook for love and justice and mercy. See, they were justifying their lack of justice, their lack of mercy, their lack of faithfulness because they tithe. And Jesus says, you tithe and you should, but don't neglect these weightier matters. The simple fact that Jesus says you do and you should is enough for me. It's red letters. And then here's one more reason. When we look at the New Testament, every reference to giving in the New Testament exceeds that of the tithe. It exceeds it. 10% was never intended to be a lid, but a launch pad. It's the jumping off point. Randy Alcorn refers to tithing as the training wheels. The training wheels of giving. We start there. When you learn to ride a bike, you had the training wheels, and you lean, and you kept going in a circle. You didn't know why, because you learned to lean 
on your training wheels. And eventually you got rid of the training wheels and you were wobbly. And mom and dad had to run with you for a while so they couldn't because mom and dad hadn't run in a while. And so and then you realized they weren't there and then you ran into a car. But you started... You started learning, you dropped the training wheels. Tithing is the training wheels. When we learn the joy of giving, we don't even, it's not like, man, I can't wait to get there someday. It's like, that was the beginning point. That was the, that was the starting blocks. See, the New Testament church gave far beyond 10%. Whereas, did you know if you took the average giving across the, the current American church, the average giving is 2.5%? 2.5%. Now, that's just that's if you took everything and divided across all attenders. But they say that 40% of adults in, in the American church don't give anything. And we wonder, where's the blessing? God says, if you will, I will. We're missing out on so much of what God could do in us and through us. Here's another quote from Randy Alcorn. He says, the, uh, quote, I only believe in grace giving claim rings hollow if it suggests that God actually expects less of new covenant Christians than old covenant people and less of today's wealthy church members than yesterday's poor Israelites. It seems to me that those making this claim need to reevaluate their concept of grace giving. It's an insult to apply the term grace to this radical lowering of standards. Grace always raises the bar. It always raises the bar. Now, I want to say this. If you're new to LifePoint or maybe you've been coming for just a little while and, man, finances are probably just a hot mess because, you know, we've all been there. Maybe you've got the idea that, man, church is just after my money. I, I want you to relax. I want to tell you a little bit about, about why this is important because it's not about money. The tithe was never put in place for God's benefit but for ours. God doesn't need your money. If he needed your money, he would just take your money, okay? He, 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 doesn't, he doesn't need it, but he wants your heart. The reason money is important is because Jesus teaches in Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You ever invested in something? Anybody jump into the crypto game a little while back? You never knew what a Dogecoin was, and then all of a sudden, it's all you. You checked it nonstop. Some of you still don't know what it is because you never invested there. Some of you are like, I'm glad I never invested. Regardless, the moment we put our money somewhere, we are invested and we care. And God says, I want your heart. And the way to have your heart is for you to return to trust with money. I remember when my wife and I, we heard a teaching from a pastor named Robert Morris. Pastor of a church called Gateway Church in Texas. Phenomenal church. He wrote this book called The Blessed Life. We've got some available at all of our campuses, or you can go to lifepointnow.com slash money if you want to buy it online. And I remember hearing this teaching, and it really radically transformed. I knew about like 10%, but I didn't know about trying to put it first and it being the first 10% and just the power of it. But my wife and I, as we shared, we were in a mess financially. And we learned this principle and we put it in play. We didn't wait to get ourselves out of the mess. We're like, it's not God's fault we're in the mess. It's our fault. We're going we're gonna to tithe as we rework our budget, as we get out of debt. And here's what Pastor Robert Morris says in the book, Blessed Life. He says, can you imagine what the body of Christ could accomplish if every believer tithed? What kind of impact the church could have on our culture and cultures around the world? Guys, this is our greatest financial year we've ever seen as a church. And if we, if we are that statistic of the average person giving 2.5, could you imagine if we step to 10%? Could you imagine the impact that could happen across our communities and around the world? Tithing teaches us how to keep God first in our life. It also teaches us how to break off the, the, the curse of greed and selfishness. Because here's the deal. Unselfish people, they make better spouses. They make better friends, relatives, employees, employers. They're, they usually are better in their finances. And here's the thing at LifePoint, there's no plate getting passed today. If you've been around for any amount of time, you know we pass plates or buckets maybe like twice a year. Maybe. We made a decision a long time ago, I'd rather just teach, teach our church what God's word says 
you wrestle it out with the Holy Spirit. You choose to honor him. And if you want to put it in a box on your way out, or if you want to give, you know, take an envelope, go old school, write a check, or put cash in it and drop it in the box, or mail it in, you can do that. Most people give online. You make the decision that you're going, going to honor God. And so every once in a while, we'll do a special offering where we'll pass buckets, but otherwise there's no buckets being passed. We want you to give because you want to give, because there is a cheerfulness and there is a joy and there is a desire to return to the Lord. And here's what I need you to know. If you never give a dollar to Life Point Church, you are welcome and you are loved. You are welcome and you are loved. We are here to serve this community. What I found is salvation is free, but ministry is expensive. And so for those of you that have said, I'll pick up the check, thank you. You allow us to make the impact that we make. And I know that many of you, you're, you're new to church, new to relationship with Jesus, probably new to the Bible. You're still figuring this stuff out. You want to move towards generosity, but let's be honest, you know, the way my bank account's currently set up, it's not there. What if you just made a decision? I, I, got, I got a couple choices. I can do nothing, keep coming, wonder what God would do and could do if I chose to trust him. You can spend the rest of your life wondering. You can do that. Or you can say, I'm gonna start where I'm at. What would it look like if you said, I want to grow in my generosity? Maybe you're not giving anything. What if you were to say, this month, I'm gonna sit down and I'm gonna figure out, how can I do 2%? That's not a tithe, but it's a start. And I'm going to take the next six months or the next year and I'm going to work from 2% to 10%. I'm going to get to this place, but i got to start changing some things. i got to redo my budget. Can I tell you, you can't out-tithe a bad budget. You're not going to out-work a bad diet. You won't out-tithe a bad budget. But if you can begin to maybe I'm going to take a little bit out of here and I'm going to put it here and I'm going to start with 2%. And the next month I'm going to go to 3%. And the next month I'm going to go to 4%. It's kind of like a couch to 5K. You ever done one of those? Like, I can't go do a 5K right now, but I can, I can go walk for a quarter mile. And then the next day, I'll go a little further. And then for those of you that are like, man, I'm, I want to do this, we offer something called the 90-Day Tithe Challenge. And it's simply this. It's simply this. I know that trusting God financially is scary. You say for the next 90 days, I'm going to step out, believing God steps in, and I'm going to take a step of faith. In 90 days from now, I'm going to tithe. I'm going to be tithing over 90 days. If at the end of 90 days, I don't feel like the favor and the blessing of God is on my life, because God says, see if I will throw open the floodgates of heaven. He invites you to test him. This is your opportunity. So for 90 days, you can go to lifepointnow.com slash 90 day. I'm going to step out for 90 days. If at the end of 90 days, you don't feel like the blessing of God is on your life. And now let me be clear when I say the blessing of God. You're not going to win the lottery in 90 days, okay? I'm not talking about like, oh my word, I tithed and the new car showed up. It was amazing. And I'm talking about there's a peace, there's a blessing, there's a, there's a, there's a sense of the, the presence of God. There, there may be a financial increase. I don't know. I'm just saying test him. See what he does. If you get to the end of 90 days and you don't feel like that's there, you email us, you call us, we'll give you back everything you gave. Because it's not about money. It's not about money. It's about heart. And lastly, to the families and individuals that do tithe, I want to say thank you. I want to let you know it is your tithes and your generosity that allow us to do what we do. When you see people getting baptized today, you picked up the bill. You made it possible for us to do what we do. When you see missions work happen, you picked up the bill. You made it possible. When we started LifePoint, we had no idea. One of the things we didn't know was how we were ever going to fund this thing. God's never let us down. Every year we've grown in generosity. And I just want to encourage you, if that's you, if you're somebody that ties, humbly share your story. Humbly share your story. We don't give to get attention and recognition, but the Bible does say spur one another on towards growth and good deeds and encouragement and your story may very well be what gives someone else the courage to step out also. You know, the Bible talks about how we're all given a variety of gifts. I don't know if you know this, but you are gifted. If you have a relationship with Jesus, the, the Holy Spirit has gifted you with spiritual gifts. One of these gifts is, is the gift of generosity. God says that if your gift is giving, in Romans chapter 12, he says if your gift is giving, give generously. One of our ministry teams is a team called Pace Setters. It's a team for those that believe that they have this gift of giving. It's not a team for the wealthy, some elite team. It's not that. 
It's for those that believe that God has given them this gift. They honor God with the tithe and they look for opportunities beyond that. You, you could be a college student who honors God with your part-time job and the tithe that comes from that and then you look for opportunities to give above that. You could be a part of that pace setters team. You could be a business owner who, who says, I'm honoring God with the tithe, but I look for opportunities. I feel like God's given me this. When I hear about opportunities, I can't wait to help make it happen. I dream of, of, of ways to bless other people. Listen, that is a gift. And we have a team to... That, that where we can encourage you and we can share with you initiatives, things we're dreaming of. You can go to lifepointnow.com slash pace setters to learn more about that. But I need you to know that it is, it is returning of the tithe, it's giving generously that allows us to make an impact across our world. And at the end of the day, tithing is about trust. Tithing is about trust. We want our mind off our money and our money off our mind. We've got to put God in his place. Do I trust God? Have I been trustworthy with what he's given me? Because if I have, I can be entrusted with more. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for such a sensitive topic. Thank you for giving us instructions in your word. And just right now, with heads bowed and eyes closed, could I ask everybody, just for maybe the next 10 seconds, to simply in this quiet moment say, God, what are you saying to me? God, what are you saying to me? Just for a few moments. Holy Spirit, what are you speaking to me? I don't believe that this is something we should respond to flippantly. I think we should prayerfully respond. We should courageously respond. I need you to know that your church is committed to helping you walk this out. We have provided resources available. If you need to contact us during the week, our team would be happy to meet with you and talk with you. What I want you to know is the same God who says, I love you enough that I'm gonna send my son to suffer and die on the cross is the same God that says, I'm gonna give you instructions through my word so that the very thing that destroys so many people won't destroy you. Today, I wanna give you this opportunity with heads bowed and eyes closed. If there's never been a time when you said yes to Jesus, can I tell you, getting your money right, all of that is secondary. It's secondary to a relationship with Christ. And if there's never been a time in your life when you said yes to Jesus, I think that's the reason you're here today. It's the reason you're, you're there at Porter's Neck today is because you need to begin a relationship with Jesus. And if you've never said yes to him, would this be your moment? The Bible tells us for all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. But it doesn't stop there. It also tells us that if we would declare with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and if we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that we will be saved. What a great promise. And so today, if you've never put your faith and your trust in Jesus, this could be your moment. We're literally gonna see 195 people get baptized today saying Jesus is my Lord and Savior. They've made this decision. And if you need to join those numbers and make that decision, this is your moment. With heads bowed, eyes closed, I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. And in this moment, I'm gonna just let you make this your prayer from your heart to the very heart of God. It goes like this. You don't need to pray this out loud, but with sincerity, would you... From the quietness of your heart, would you say, dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus for me. I believe that what Jesus did on the cross, he did for me. I put my trust in Jesus. I repent of my sin. I ask you to be my Lord and my Savior. I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit today. Give me the strength to live for you. And I thank you for saving me. For just a moment with heads bowed and eyes closed. If that's you today, when I count to three, would you raise your hand high in the air? I wanna see that hand across our campuses. Our campus pastors wanna see that and celebrate with you on the count of three. If today you say, I just joined you in that moment. One, two, three, would you raise it high? Saying, that's me today, I just said yes to Jesus. Just for another moment, if you just keep that hand up for a second. Over to my left, hands going up, incredible. While your hand is up, one of our team members, if they see it, they're gonna bring a connect card to you and put it in your hand. We'd love to ask you to take a moment and just fill that out. Our host will give you a few instructions when we're done here. Your name matters to us. We'd love to be an encouragement to you. If for some reason we miss your hand, there's a card on the seat back in front of you. You can grab one of those and fill it out. But let's do this right now. Can we put our hands down and across all campuses, can we celebrate together today? Come on.